conceived the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. And how great the pain of searing loss. And the Father turns his face away. As wounds which mar the chosen one. Bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross. My sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice. Call out among the scoffers. And it was my sin that had Until it was accomplished, his dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no will. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. And why should I gain from his reward? And I cannot give an answer. But this I know. His wounds have paid my ransom. And why should I gain from his reward? And I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Hill where your blood was spilt for my ransom, yeah, yeah. Oh, and everything I once held dear, I count it all as lost. Well, lead me to the cross where your love poured out. And you were as I, 
you tempted and tried human the word became flesh you bore my sin and death now you're in Count it all as lost. Well, lead me to the cross where your love poured out. And bring me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. And rid me of myself, I belong to you. just to bring something that's a worth that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself it's not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart i'm coming back to the heart of worship when it's all about you it's all about you jesus i'm sorry for the thing I've made it when it's all about you it's all about you Jesus king of endless worth no one could express just how much you deserve can pour yeah all I have is yours every single breath I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself it's not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship when it's all about you. 
It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. This one's got a bit of a tone switch. It's got a call in, in response in it. So there's going to be a part where I'm going to say, tell me, is he good? And that's when you guys yell out, he's good. And tell me, is he God? And that's where you guys yell out, he's God. All right. And good God almighty, I hope you'll find me. You praise in your name no matter what comes. And I can count for the times I've called your name some broken night. And you showed up and patched me up like you do every time. I get amnesia. I forget that you keep coming around. Yeah, there ain't no way you'll ever let me down. And good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. You're praising your name no matter what comes. Because I know where I'd be without your mercy so i keep praising your name at the top of my lungs tell me is he good tell me is he god and he is good god almighty and you say your love goes on forever that your mercy never stops so why would I assume you'd be somebody that you're not? Like a sun in the morning, know you're going to be there every day. So what on earth could make me be afraid? Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. You're praising your name no matter what comes. Because I know where I'd be. Without your mercy, so I keep praising your name at the top of my lungs. Tell me, is he good? Tell me, is he God? And he is good God Almighty. Praise him in the morning, praise him in the noontime, praise him when the sun goes down. Love him in the morning, love him in the noontime, love him when the sun goes down. Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. You're praising your name no matter what comes. Cause I know where I'd be without your mercy. So I keep praising your name at the top of my lungs. Tell me, is he good? Tell me, is he God? And he is good God Almighty. And Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noontime, Jesus when the sun goes down. Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noontime, Jesus when the sun goes down. Dear Heavenly Father, I just lift up your name, and I thank you and praise you for who you are, and I praise you that you are good God Almighty. I just thank you that this pastor here has traveled so far to come speak to you, uh, speak about you, and I just pray that all of his words are said that are honoring and glorifying to you, and that your name be lifted high, and I just thank you for that. In your name I pray, amen. 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 <laughs>
praise you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Jesus. I, I have no idea what Jonathan's going to preach tonight. We haven't even discussed it today. So I, uh, I just know that I woke up with that feeling this morning. It went right along with what the message that was just given. That, And I said a little bit earlier that this is, this is the time we press in. And, uh, and he'll get to preach in a second, but I'm gonna, I want to share something with you. Um, the, uh, back in the early 90s, I believe it was 1994, somewhere around there, uh, there was a great revival that broke out in Pensacola, Florida. Brownsville Assembly of God in Pensacola, Florida. People came from all over the world. Millions of people came from all over the world to, to just be a part of what was going on with this revival. But, but there's something very interesting about that revival that there, there's two important things to understand about what happened in that revival leading up to the revival before uh, the brother got up to preach. It was a Father's Day, which is just a couple weeks away, uh, but it was a Father's Day and they were just doing a revival and, and he was coming in to just preach one service for his friend, which was the pastor, John Kilpatrick, and, and, uh, and he was just going to preach that one night. But leading up to that, Pastor Kilpatrick had asked the church to begin to pray and they went into an intense time of prayer leading up to the revival just as I have been putting in the bulletin and encouraging every week and every service that we have got to pray because if we want real revival it's not going to come because we hear a good message it's not going to come because Jonathan's a fiery preacher he is He's a powerful, anointed man of God, but just because he preaches an anointed message does not bring revival. What brings revival is getting down and sacrificing your time and prayer and getting yourself ready for the heart change and all the things that are coming. That's part one. Part two comes in after revival begins. You see, there in at Brownsville Assembly of God, they went from planning a one-week revival. This was back when we used to have revivals that started Sunday and went to Sunday, and then they'd keep going if they could, right? And those don't happen as often anymore. There's a few that are here and there where they just keep going and going because God is moving in such a powerful way, but still, usually after a couple of weeks, they die off. But I want to tell you that when revival begins to happen... And we start to see a powerful move of God and people are so hungry for God that nothing else matters because we must just focus on the cross and what God wants us to do. It's exhausting. The worship team has to show up every night. The people, the preacher has to come up with a new message every night. The greeter's got to be at the door every night. People are flooding into a place and, and you're seeing amazing things happen. But it takes a sacrifice of time. It takes a sacrifice of yourself. And you've got to even, they even made it a, a rule. They didn't have services at all. Everybody had the day off on Mondays because they needed one day of rest. And they were doing services, multiple services services every day except for Monday and this went on for five years because of the power of prayer and people willing to get themselves out of the way and say I don't care what it takes I'm willing to pray and push through and pray and push through and pray and push through until we receive the breakthrough, until we receive the revival, until we see what is going to happen, what God is going to do. Because I'm going to tell you what, it is not God that is stopping revivals from happening all over the place. It is the people that are not willing to tarry. I'm going to tell you, and I'm not talking about Terry in the sound booth. I'm talking about being willing to take the time at the altars and pray and pray, and not just at the beginning or the leading to, but at the end of the service where you pray. And if you haven't got what you came to the altar to get, you keep praying. And if you still don't get it, you grab somebody to pray with you, and you get the whole church praying for you because you know that you need what God has for you. 
We get worried about what time it is. Because it's getting late, right? And, and we want to we wanna make sure we're able to get up in the morning. We got work to do. We got places to be. We got, and if you're retired, you don't really got to get up in the morning. But, uh, you know, there's still something to do, right? But I've been in more than one revival services, set of services, where we were at the altars until 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night because we were hungry for what God had. We weren't hungry for getting a bite and heading home. Now, I don't know if that's what God's got for us tonight, but I want to tell you that if we really want to see a move of God, we've got to die to ourselves. We've got to die to ourselves and push in and be willing to not just receive, because we all want to receive. We're all gimme gimmies, aren't we? God, I need, I need, I need. But we got to be willing to push in, push through, and tarry at the altars. I hope I didn't preach any of your sermon there, brother. But uh, I'm, I'm done with my little mini sermon. I just, I really felt impressed to say that tonight, especially with the message tonight, that we have got to be willing to wait on God and do what is necessary to truly receive what God has for us. Brother, would you come give another Bethel welcome welcome to uh, Jonathan Thacker. Two more services, brother. Let me get you set up here. The Apostle Jude warning that false teaching and false preaching said that the church should contend earnestly for the faith. Paul said that our faith should be that like a runner running a race. Am I still on? Let me jump to this one. A race, and that we should run the race in such a way to obtain the prize. Paul said that we should fight the good fight of faith and lay hold of eternal life. But I found that there is such a pressure. There's a pressure both on the outside of this church building and many times there is a pressure also within the walls of the church. There's a pressure not to contend but to concede. There's a pressure not to run in such a way to obtain the prize but the church better, they better tread lightly. Come on somebody. There's a pressure not to fight for the faith but to retreat and fear of offense. The church has always faced a pressure. Anytime she begins to go in a direction that counters the culture. For example, in America alone, abortion was legalized, I believe it was in the year of 1973. And since that day, more than 50 million mothers have went down and visited an abortion clinic and made a decision to dispose of an unborn child. If America were to take a moment of silence for every child that has been aborted from today to the very beginning, from 1973. If America was to take a moment of silence for every child, America would have to be silent for more than 100 years. And America's same-sex marriage was legalized in 2015. 
And since that day, more than one million people have went and stood and made a covenant to one another to live in what God calls an abomination. And everybody in this building either knows someone, maybe you're related to, or at the very least you know someone that struggles with the sin of homosexuality. So there is such a pressure not to say anything about what God has to say about it. Sir or ma'am, make no mistake, as great as America is, our country is changing. Just in last year, our own United States Congress opened up with a prayer that many of you will remember, a prayer that ended with the man, the preacher that stood before our people, and he ended the prayer with a man and a woman. But I believe tonight that it should be more notable, not with how he ended the prayer, but it, be, it should be more noted that the man that prayed the prayer was an ordained Methodist minister. And he prayed to a Hindu god by the name of Braham. The prayer was given before our 117th United States Congress. More than 435 represent, representatives, 100 senators of which 90% identified, they checked the box, that Christianity was their religion. And that screams to us that it is not how we identify ourselves that matter. But it's what we truly are that matters. There's a reason that Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. He said, you are a city that is built upon a hill. Listen, it's intimidating to stand against the pressure. It's intimidating when we all have loved ones that maybe are, are dealing or struggling with some type of sin or, or somebody that we love that has had an abortion or whatever the situation may, it may be. It's intimidating to stand against the pressure and to speak God's word in those moments. But friend, if there has ever been a day in our lifetime that we should stand against the pressure, if there's ever been a day that we should open up the, our mouths and in a spirit of love speak the truth of God, friend, let it be known tonight that it is now. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, I want you to turn with me over to the book of Acts the fourth chapter. Acts chapter 4. We arrive on a scene where Peter and John, in this moment, they themselves are facing a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous amount of pressure. Acts chapter 4. If you're ready for the reading of God's Word, somebody shout amen in this house. Acts chapter 4. We're going to begin down. Let's jump down to verse number 5. Scripture says, and it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Ananias the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had, when they had seen, set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, being filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of, Jer of Israel, if, with, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. 
This is the stone which was rejected by the builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I just want to preach to you for the next few moments tonight simply on the theme, the title, Let It Be Known. Saints of God, will you help me one more time? Pray for, pray over this service. Lord, we love you tonight. And Father, we are so thankful, Lord, for anointed worship. We are so thankful, Lord, for a house that we can come in and lift up your holy name. But Father, we didn't come to go through the motions tonight. We came to hear from you. And I ask God for every person in this building, Lord, that is battling the pressure of this culture, that is fighting, that is trying to hold on to your truth and try to stay, trying to stay amongst this last day generation. Lord, I ask that you would send your spirit to give us a, a great a spirit of boldness. Lord, to stand and to speak the truth, even when it may be offensive. Lord, that we may be a people that speak your truth and speak it Lord with pride and speak it Lord Lord it would just just knowing that your word is true in spite of what anybody else says Lord knowing that we are standing upon your word that you would give us a boldness to speak in this last day bless this word bless your people in the mighty name of Jesus we pray and everyone in an agreement shouted amen just days before the trial of Peter and John. Scripture tells us that there was actually another trial. Matthew 27 tells us that Jesus himself stood in the middle of the Sanhedrin in the court and he himself was under a tremendous amount of pressure. Jesus stood before all of the religious rulers. He stood before the scribes, the Pharisees, Caiaphas, the high priest. Jesus stood before all earthly power because his message was an offense to the hearer. So the Sanhedrin court decided not to kill Jesus, but to crucify Jesus. In other words, they made up their mind that they were going to kill Jesus in such a way that it would cause him the most horrific death that one could endure in that day. To be crucified on a cross was an excruciating way to die. This was something that the Romans had perfected. They wanted to keep you alive just long enough to endure torture and more pain and more pain. As a matter of fact, the very word that we use... Today, in the English language, that word excruciating, you can trace it all the way back to the agony of the cross. In that day, when they would hang men up on crosses and they would torture them to death, there was no word that they could come up with. There was no word that was great enough to describe the agony of being nailed to a Roman cross, so they created a word. They took the word for the Latin word or the Greek word for cross, which is crux, and, and they took the, uh, an, another word for crucify, C-R-U-C, and they blended them together, and they created the Latin word excrucio. And that word, what it literally meant was to be born, a pain that was born only could only come out of the agony of a Roman cross. And today, it, years, thousands of years later, you and I, everyone in this room, we have all used that word excruciating, not even knowing what it truly meant. What it seemed it must have been as Jesus stood there before all the upper management, all the upper rulers, if you will, under the threat of being crucified and having to endure an excruciating death. Jesus stood before the Sanhedrin court. Jesus stood before all of the rulers, those that identified themselves as being a people that know God and a people that speak for God. Yet ironically, at the very same time, they hated the message of God. It is impossible to have a genuine love for God 
and not have a genuine love for every word that God has spoken. I don't care how somebody chooses to identify themselves tonight. I, 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 don't, I don't care what label that they may put upon their life. Friend, it's who we are. It's the life that we are living and the love of the word that is flowing through our lives that truly matters. You see, it was the message that Jesus spoke. This is the reason that they really hated him. It wasn't because he opened up blinded eyes. It wasn't because he healed withered hands. It wasn't because he worked miracle after miracle after miracle. It was the message that Jesus was speaking. Jesus said things that nobody else had ever said before. Jesus said things like, I am the way. Friend, Muhammad didn't say that. Buddha didn't say that. Jesus said... If you've seen me, he said, you've seen the Father. Jesus said, I am the Christ. And if Jesus refused to denounce the truth, then he would be crucified. They had the scriptures, they had the truth, but they had no understanding of who Jesus really was. The light shined in the darkness, but the darkness did not comprehend it. And because of the offense, they took Jesus before the highest court with one mission, and that was to crucify him on a Roman cross. Can you imagine it tonight if you will? All of a sudden, the high priest looks down from his high place. The Sanhedrin court, everybody is there. Every big wig in in town, everyone is there. And suddenly, he looks down at Jesus in a seamless white robe. And he's in shackles. And he's standing there. and And the high priest looks down with a tone of mocking and a tone of irony. Looks down and says to Jesus, Are you the Son of God? To which Jesus immediately responded, it is as you say, I am. And because of his claim to divinity, they crucified him. And praise God, history records not only did he die, but Jesus climbed up out of the tomb again in three days, just like he said that he would. Friend, there's a reason why the world was turned upside down some 2,000 years ago. But now Peter and John are facing the same high court that Jesus had already faced. The same religious scribes, the same uh, high priests, the same Pharisees. It is a scene that no doubt between Peter and John, it was a scene that looked all too familiar. You see, the court had, that had ru- the court that had ruled over Jesus was now ruling over them. And once again, they have some questions. A man has been healed, and as far as they were concerned, Jesus, the miracle worker, was dead. So the question that they had is how? The religious rulers looked down at Peter and John. They said, how, by what power, how have you done this? And Peter and John, fully knowing what Jesus had already went through, fully knowing the agony and the excruciating pain of being nailed to a Roman cross and what it meant to be crucified, knowing what they did to Jesus immediately after he he gave his answer, surely this must have been an intimidating prayer. Question. No doubt there must have been a great amount of pressure. Peter, don't say anything. John, just look down. There must have been a pressure not to lift up their head, not to speak a word. There must have been a pressure just to be silent in that moment. Because if they could find fault in an innocent man, then no doubt. They could find fault in them. And Peter and John, in that moment, were were, were placed in a great place of pressure. The mission of the Sanhedrin court 
was to crucify the body of Jesus. But this time, the mission was not to crucify the body, but it was to crucify their faith. Can I tell somebody tonight, there may not be a lynch mob on the outside of this church. There may not be anybody that's threatening to kill you or stone you to death or or nail you to a Roman cross. But friend, there is an underlying underbelly. There is a there is a, a, a movement of, of the devil himself that is trying not to maybe not to kill you, but the devil, what he's trying to do in these last days, he's trying to silence the church and he's trying to kill our faith. Because if the enemy can crucify the message, then there's no need to crucify the messenger. The enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, friend. Now listen, he is really not after you. He's really not after your job. He's not really after your ministry. He's not really after your family. What the enemy is trying to get a hold of, he's trying to kill your faith. Because faith is the one thing that will cause you to keep on pushing. Faith is the one thing... that will cause you to keep on walking even through impossible situations. That was not really trying to kill you. Friend, he knows death is a part of life. Every person in this building, every one of us, one of these days are going to die. What the enemy is trying to kill is the message. What he's trying to kill is faith in God because he knows what faith in God can do. Faith is the one thing. That'll cause you to stand when everybody around you is bowing down to a culture that is going in the wrong direction. Faith is the one thing that'll cause you to keep pushing through the crowd. Faith is the one thing that that little that that woman with the issue of blood had that when everybody uh, everybody would have pushed her aside. By truth be told, according to Levitical law, she shouldn't have been she shouldn't even been out around other people. But it was faith that caused her to push through the crowd. And she reached in and grabbed a hold of the garment of Jesus. And the moment that she kept on pushing, and I don't know if she climbed under or climbed over, all I know is she got a hold of Jesus. And the moment she got a hold of Jesus, power began to flow out of him. And suddenly Jesus stopped in his tracks and he said, Somebody touch me. It was faith that caused her to push through that crowd. It was the faith of a Canaanite woman that had a dire situation and she goes to Jesus and Jesus looked at her and he said it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Can you imagine Jesus talking to you like that? But it was faith that caused her not to turn and run. It was faith that allowed her not to just get offended and throw in the towel and give up. No, no, no. She had faith in the message of Jesus. Jesus said it's not good to throw the bread to the dogs. And in faith, that Canaanite woman looked right back at Jesus. And she said, yes, Lord. But even the little dogs want to eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And in that moment, it's, uh, Jesus himself, he spun around and he said, Great is thy faith. And he gave her what she came for. Why? Because faith is power. Faith is the one thing that will cause you to keep on pushing through all the stuff even when the weight's too heavy. Faith is the one thing that will cause you to keep swinging even when the fight is over and the final bell has rung. Faith is dangerous. Faith is the very thing that caused John the Baptist to stand up under a tremendous amount of pressure. The law said, if you open up your mouth, we're going to kill you. John the Baptist knew that he had seduced his brother's wife. John the Baptist knew that he was living in adultery and in fornication. And John the Baptist, even with the pressure to be silent and back up and shut up, John the Baptist opened up his mouth and he said, Buddy, you better get that sin out of your life. You better leave that woman alone because if you don't repent, it's going to send you to a devil's hell. And they took John and they cut off his head. And they placed it on a platter. Faith is dangerous. 
Because faith doesn't rest in the wisdom of men. But faith rests in the power of God. Faith can move mountains. Faith can walk on water. It was faith when Peter climbs out of the boat and he defies gravity and he walks on what's impossible. And Jesus looked at him after he put him back in the boat. Peter has just walked on water. Jesus looked at him and he said, little is your faith. I'm going to tell you something. If this preacher brings, if pastor fills up the baptismal and I get out here and walk on water, y'all better say that preacher's got great faith. But Jesus looked down at Peter and he said, little is your faith. Hear me, friend. The real power in faith is not found in the level. But the real power of faith, whether it's great faith or little faith, it doesn't matter the level of faith. The real power of faith is found in the object. And as long as our object is on Jesus, there is nothing. If we've got faith in Him and faith on His Word, there is nothing that we cannot overcome. Peter and John understood that this wasn't really about them. It wasn't even about their level of faith. But what it was really about was the position of the faith that they had. The very reason that Peter and John had been arrested was because of their faith. John and Peter had went down to the temple to pray. Can you imagine what might happen if you just show up at the prayer meeting? They weren't even looking to heal nobody. They were just going to the house of God to spend a little time in prayer. And as they were on the way to the prayer meeting, that's where the, the man is sitting outside the temple gate and he's, he's begging for alms, he's begging for money. And Peter, being full of the Holy Ghost, he looked down at this broken man, this man that needed a whole lot more than money. He thought that money was going to fix it, but friend, money ain't going to ever fix what you need. What people really need in this generation is not more money or more success, but what they really need is the Holy Ghost to encounter their life. Peter looked down at them and he said, Silver and gold have I none, but that, that, that which I have I give to thee in the name of Jesus. And he reached down and grabbed that broken body and immediately a miracle happened and he stood up and he began to walk on the impossible and after it happened the people were amazed and I love when I read the passage that after the miracle that Peter didn't just get up and start prancing around like he was some super spiritual person but Peter knew in that moment that the same Jesus that had been healing on earth was the same Jesus that even right now was positioned at the right hand of God. And the same Jesus that healed on earth in that moment, he was also healing from heaven. I don't know about you, but I get tired of preachers that prance around when God does something and act like that there's some kind of super spiritual person. Come on, y'all. Listen, I, I don't know anybody that claims to heal in their own power. But I do know a few who try to give the impression that the healing happens because they're so spiritual or they're just so super godly. Come on, y'all. Don't look at nobody. Stay right here with me. Come on. <laughs> Got to be careful. Let me tell you something. Sometimes... I pray for people in the altar service, and sometimes God heals them. Thank you, Jesus. Then other times I pray for people in the altar service, and God doesn't heal them. I've learned a lot of long, long time ago that I can't do it. If I pray for you and God heals you, praise God. If I pray for you and God doesn't heal you, Praise God anyway. Come on. Listen, I, I'm, not, I'm not in management. I'm just in sales. Come on, y'all. I know who I am. And I know who He is. I know who's got the power. And it's Jesus. 
And Peter looks at the people and he's, and he's, and he's looking, he's telling them, he says, why are y'all looking at me like I'm somebody? Peter knew that he had nothing to do with the miracle. Peter knew that it was all Jesus. And because of the miracle, the crowds began to come. And Peter understanding that real faith doesn't come by miracles. Temporary faith will come by miracles. But real faith comes by hearing and by hearing the Word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That's the very reason in that moment that Peter started preaching. Peter lifted up his voice and he began to preach Jesus crucified and risen from the dead. In that moment, Peter began to preach repentance. Peter is literally preaching a message. Change your mind about Jesus. By this time, the news of the miracle had spread all across town and everybody was coming to see this broken man that they'd all seen so many times before. This broken vessel that knew it was impossible and everybody was running to see the miracle. And of those that came were some of the Pharisees. And when the Pharisees heard the preaching of the word... They got offended. So they took Peter and John and they had them arrested and they had them beaten and they had them thrown into prison in an attempt to kill the message. In an attempt to make them shut up and just keep their mouth silent. So when the Bible says, and it came to pass on the next day, that Peter and John had been drug out, not an attempt to kill them, but to intimidate them, silence them. Why? Because if the enemy can crucify the messenger of God, then there's no need to crucify the messenger of God. In this moment, court was in session. All the big shots were there. All the high priests and all the scribes, everybody was there. And it must have been an intimidating moment. As Peter and John had stood there in chains. The message was offensive to the Pharisees. It went against everything that they'd been, they'd been teaching. It, it went against their religion. It went against their interpretation of Scripture. It went against their culture. It went against what they wanted the Word to say. And there was such a pressure on Peter and John just to sit back. Just to be silent. And friend, today you and I are all facing that very same pressure when it comes to, to the truth of the Word of God. We are facing it in the house of God, on the outside of, the, outside of this house. We are facing a pressure in our families. Don't speak it. Don't say because it might just offend somebody. Come on, y'all. But the early disciples knew if there was ever a day in their lifetime to stand against the pressure if there was ever a day to contend earnestly for the faith to run their race to fight for the faith something on the inside of them said it is right now and under the pressure Peter wiped the blood from his brow and he lifted up his head amongst all the people that were watching in that moment and all of a sudden he in the pressure he lifted up his face he lifted up his voice and he said let it be known to you all and all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified but God raised from the dead he said let it be known I believe that Jesus is still the way let it be known that no matter how offensive the message may be baby we got to repent we got to get right we got to turn from our sin to follow Jesus I believe that we need to let it be known that the gospel is still the only way we've got to let it be known that Jesus died and rose from the dead his faith was not in a temporary faith but it was a real faith that was willing to stand even under all the pressure and I wonder tonight I wonder does the church still have that kind of faith that will still stand 
Even if they threaten to kick in the door. Throw us in jail. Even if it costs us our livelihood or God forbid even our lives. Do we have the kind of faith that will truly stand? Because it's not how we identify ourselves that matters. But it's what we truly are. That's going to make the difference. Make no mistake, it was offensive for Peter to say what he said. Truth be told, it even sounds a little bit crazy. Peter is telling men that have been trained their entire lives. He's telling them, forget everything that you know. And put your faith in Jesus Christ. By the way, friend, Christ is not the last name of Jesus. That word Christ is the title of who Jesus was. Christ literally means the anointed one. Thousands of Jesus, thousands of years before Jesus ever was birthed into this earth, uh, it was prophecy, it was foretold that there was someone that was coming. Who would redeem mankind. Who would redeem Israel. Who would turn the world around. But the question that so many have and still today have. Was this Jesus that Peter so boldly preached. Was he truly the Messiah? Was he really the one? That's the real question. It's not a bad question to ask. I'm talking to somebody. It's not wrong to say is Jesus really who they said that he was. Because I just happen to know that some prophecies can be manipulated. I like how y'all are shouting tonight. Psalms 22, famous passage of scripture. Many of you know it by heart. Pointing ahead to the Christ that would come. That he would say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And a thousand years later, Jesus is hanging on a cross, being crucified to death. And Jesus from the cross shouts out, my God, my God, connecting himself to prophecy. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I don't know if that's enough to do it for you, but it's not enough to do it for me because I know anybody could shout that out. But Psalms 22 doesn't just say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But the prophet said, he followed it with, after it happened, that they would shoot off at the lip, that they would mock him, that they would wag and shake their heads at him, shouting, If you really are the one, bring yourself down. And moments after Jesus connected himself to prophecy, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Here come the scribes and the rulers shaking their heads, mocking and laughing, just like he said they would. If Jesus is not who he said that he was, how did he do that? Some prophecies can be manipulated. Some things can be controlled. But some things, it's impossible. After it happened, the scripture says that Psalm 22 says that his hands and his feet would be pierced. And that he would die an excruciating death. But I just happen to know that Jesus was not the only man that was nailed on a Roman cross. Under the leadership of Nero alone, some 2,000 people were crucified on crosses in a single day. So for someone to be crucified, for me, it is not enough. But the scripture didn't, didn't just say that he would be crucified. It said not a bone. A thousand years before, he said not one bone would be broken. 
And when they had Jesus hanging on the cross, this is literally death by asphyxiation. It was excruciating way to die. Your body would begin to pull down from the weight of the nails. Your chest cavity would begin to, to slump down. You were literally starving for breath. You were, you were strangling. And the only way... As you are dying on a cross, the only way that anyone could get a sense of relief was to take their hands and pull down from the nails and push up from the nails, driven through the feet, just to get their body high enough to take a breath. See, that's why they would break the knees. Disable the knees. Disable the victim from pushing up off the cross and speeding up the process of death. All the devil had to do was break the knees of Jesus. And I would stand up here and tell you that he's not who he said he was. Why? doesn't matter that there's more than 300 prophecies. Jesus had to get every single one right to be who he said that he was. And when the soldiers came and they began to break the knees of the criminal on this side and they broke the knees of the criminal on the other side but when they got to the knees of Jesus praise God he threw that old hammer down and not one bone was broken again prophecy was fulfilled he picks up a spear pierces his side again prophecy is being fulfilled there are millions I believe the hundreds maybe even thousands of reasons of prophecies that point proving beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus was he was who he said that he was friend he died and he rose Jesus is the Christ and Jesus is still the way put your faith in Jesus this is not a book of fairy tales it's true there is a heaven there is a hell there is a world beyond this one and Jesus paid the price for us put your faith in Jesus It's not just a religion. It's not just an identity that we claim, but it's a truth that we have. Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus is the anointed one. Jesus is the Christ. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Make no mistake. Peter knew exactly who Jesus was. Surrounded By Pharisees, surrounded by scribes, surrounded by this pressure to keep silent. But even with all the pressure to roll over, even though the message of Jesus was unpopular to the masses, he opened up his mouth and he said, let it be known. And I've come to tell somebody tonight that the message of the word of God still has not changed. Jesus is still the way. It may be a to the culture it may go against what the world wants to believe our rulers can pray to a false Hindu god Abraham if they want to they can change all the laws they can confuse every gender they can abort every baby they can change our education system but I've come to tell somebody tonight that real faith will not retreat in fear or offense I'm going to contend earnestly for the faith I made up my mind I'm going to run my race. I'm going to fight the good fight of faith. I'm going to preach Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead and one day coming back again. I'm going to preach a Jesus that calls the prodigal out of the pig pen. I'm going to preach a Jesus that can turn our life around and make us live holy. That's why the Bible says, Therefore, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Friend, there's a change that happens when Jesus gets a hold of our lives. Let it be known tonight. The monotheistic God, Braham, has never made a blind man see. The monotheistic God, Braham, has never made a deaf man hear. 
the monotheistic God, Braham, has never restored a broken marriage. He's never healed a broken family. And he's never set a captive free. But there is another name. And it's a name that's above the name of Braham. It's a name that's above the name of Buddha. It's a name that's above the name of Muhammad. It's a name that millions claim healing. And millions claim deliverance. And tonight, millions still are claiming freedom. It's a name that every knee is going to bow down to. And one of these days every tongue is going to confess it's a name that gives sight to the blind it's a name that gives hope to the hopeless and freedom to the captive it's a name who was crucified but God raised from the dead it's the only name that brings salvation for there is no other name under heaven given among men that by we which we must be saved it's a name that God raised from the dead let it be known to you all and the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Jesus Christ, whom was crucified, but God raised from the dead. Friend, we've got to let the truth be known tonight. Sister, can I have you come and begin to play if you're comfortable? If not, we can put a CD on. But we've got to let it be known tonight who God is. We are in the last days. And I know you've heard it preached over and over and over again. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. But one of these days, it's going to happen. And I believe it's going to be soon when God calls this church home. And there are going to be so many people, whether we're raptured out of here or, or later on, that will stand before God. And they're going to say, God, I wasn't ready. God, I didn't know that you were really about to come back. It's going to be so many that say, Lord, I wasn't ready. And I believe that God will say to them, did I not send enough preachers? Did I not give you my word over and over and over again that you had to repent that I was coming back? Friend, if you've been playing games with God, you better quit playing games with God. Jesus is coming back. And I know it's not easy with all the pressure in this world. Everyone in this building, we all know somebody that's had an abortion. And listen, if you've had an abortion, I'm not here to throw rocks at you. We got it under the blood. Life's going to go forward. Amen. But who I'm talking to are those young ladies that have yet to make that decision. Those young ladies that are broken and hopeless. Friend, don't you dare throw that baby away. You'll regret it for the rest of your life. It's difficult. It's offensive to talk about abortion. Because when you start talking about it, it's going to be somebody doesn't like you. It's difficult to talk about homosexuality because we all have family or someone that we love maybe that is struggling with that particular sin. And there's a pressure. Just don't say nothing. Just let it go. Such a pressure. But friend, if there's ever a day that we've got to let the truth be known, I'm not telling you to beat somebody over the head with the Bible. But I'm telling you with a spirit of love, we've got to speak the truth. We've got to tell this world they still need Jesus. There's a message being preached that you can get to heaven any which way. It's not true. Jesus is the only way. It's the only way. And I don't want to see anybody miss heaven. I don't want to see any sin keep some. Listen, I'm not talking about stumbling. I'm not, everybody makes mistakes. Don't, don't misinterpret me. But when we choose to marry our sin, when we choose to live in habitual sin, we will not make heaven. And for those family members, those people we love, those people at your workplace, wherever they may be, they need the mercy and the grace of God just like you and I did. They need the truth of God just like you and I need the truth of God. In a world that's confused and a, and a generation that has been turned upside down, they are hungry for the truth. And I believe that God is looking for somebody that will let the truth be known. If you're able, can you stand to your feet across this building? I know I was a little bit heavy tonight. 
But friend, we've got to do something. The days of just going to church and sitting our, on our three inches of foam and saying amen, that's, this is a day we've got to start doing something. We've got to start throwing the lifelines to a generation that is lost and without God. We've got to have the truth on the inside of us so that we can answer those questions in that moment of decision. I believe tonight that God is looking for a church that will boldly stand on His Word and let the truth be known. Is there a pressure not to? Absolutely. Is it offensive? You better believe it. Are some people going to laugh at you and say that you're crazy? Yes. But the Word of God is true. And God is looking for somebody that will let it be known. If you're here tonight and you say, Preacher, I've, I've been facing that pressure. Maybe a situation with a loved one and maybe somebody in your family. Maybe it's your workplace. But there is something that you know that God's Word disapproves of. And there's a pressure not to say anything about it. There's a pressure just to be silent. And you are facing that. I'm talking to somebody. You're facing that in your workplace, your family. I don't know what it is. Could be somebody very close to you that you love. But there's a pressure just to, just to be silent. And you're battling with how and what to say. But tonight, you know that you've got to let the truth be known. If that's you, I'm not going to embarrass you. But if you're here tonight and you're facing that pressure, I'm just going to ask that you step out from your seat and make your way to the front of this church. I, I'd like to pray for you. I'm fighting. It's not that you don't love God. It's just pressure. Hear me, friend. The truth spoken without love brings condemnation. But the truth spoken with love brings conviction. Conviction breaks walls. You're fighting some battles. But tonight, you've made up your mind. God's speaking to me, and it's time that I go outside of just regular church and regular formats. It's time that God doesn't just use the preacher or the pastor, but it's time for God to use me in my circle. And tonight, I've made up my mind. I'm going to let the truth be known to this dying generation. God's going to use me to take a soul to heaven.